Security. What we want is to be able to know a timestamp on a transaction and where it is in history, and actually know at a moment in time that you know the answer and that you know that you know the answer. And you want to never be wrong. And everyone will know the same answer. That is Byzantine fault tolerance. If you can do that, even when some of the nodes are malicious, and even when a malicious person can even influence the internet and maybe have firewalls and things. That's what Byzantine fault tolerance is. Notice I said you come to a moment when you know for sure. That's different from some of the proof of work systems where you just become more and more sure over time. Those aren't Byzantine fault tolerant because you never know for sure, you just become more confident. And you can start having problems with partitions with that sort of a system. So what you want is Byzantine fault tolerance where you absolutely know Guaranteed, and as long as not too many people are malicious, they cannot stop this or make you come to a false consensus. So that's BFT. So Hashgraph is BFT. But that's not all. In order to prove that, you have to make some assumptions. What do you have to assume? Do you have to assume something about the timing of the internet? That messages going across the internet will always get there fast and will never be lost or always get there within some time period. That sounds like a reasonable assumption, unless you've heard of botnets and DDoS attacks. Sometimes the attackers will go out and compromise a number of little computers on the internet, web cameras and printers and little things, and have all of them flood one computer with messages so much that it can't send or receive any messages. It basically shuts it down from the rest of the internet. If you have a synchronous Byzantine fault tolerance system, the one that doesn't have this good property, maybe you could shut down the whole network by just shutting down one computer. So what you want is asynchronous BFT. A BFT is saying that, yes, we can survive that fine. If they shut down one computer, we'll still reach consensus and we'll still always be right and never be in disagreement. And we'll know that we're right and we'll know when we've done it. So that's A BFT. We want to be able to survive malicious nodes, we want to be able to survive firewalls that are stopping our packets or letting some through and not others or delaying them by an amount of time that keeps changing or all sorts of strange things and these distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks. So this is what ABFT is. This is the gold standard for 30 years. It's a very old term. There are actually people that have sometimes have made up new terms that sound sort of like ABFT, uh, newer terms that are weaker than ABFT. But the gold standard, the one that is stronger, is ABFT. And that's what we've had for decades in distributed computing and in databases and in um, Byzantine fault tolerant computing in general. So we have that. But in addition to that, we have something called state proofs that are very important. So the state proof means that you have a client, you have a wallet program on your phone, and you call up some computer in the network, and you say, please do a transaction for me. I will digitally sign it to say I want money to move, uh, or I want um, my cryptocurrency, I mean, to move from this account to this account, or I want to store a file, or I want to ask you, hey, does this file exist? And the node gives you an answer. It says, no, that file doesn't exist. Are they lying? Do you know they're telling the truth? Do I have to trust one single computer to not be malicious? With a state proof, that one single computer gives you this small little proof. They say, there's no, that file doesn't exist in the ledger, and here's a proof that the whole community had a consensus on that fact. They can't lie. That's what a state proof does. Or you say, please do this cryptocurrency transfer from one account to another. They say, yes, it has gone through. Or yes, this is the balance. And then they give you the state proof. And they can't lie. It proves that this was the consensus of the community. And no one bad actor can compromise that. State proofs are very important. It makes them truthful. Furthermore, I said it's the consensus of the community. Which community? What if we forked and there's now two communities that I didn't know? No. It not only says it's the consensus of the community, it tells you which community. That's an interesting concept. That is saying that if one of these nodes takes our state, our state is all the files we're storing, all the cryptocurrency balances, all the results of the smart contracts, and it copies it, it forks it, and gets a bunch of other computers to help it, and forms a new network. And so now you have two ledgers that have been forked, and each of them starts making changes, and they keep evolving over time differently. 
this wallet on your phone knows for sure which one it's talking to. It knows that it is talking to the official one that it's always been talking to and its consensus successors and not to this fake one that was set up or this new one. It knows that it's a separate thing. So, of course, technically, you can always copy information, but you can't fool anyone into thinking that it's the original or that it's the official one. So this is what state proofs allow us to do. And this is another form of security that is important. Not the security of the consensus, but the security of the clients that are using the consensus. This is good, ooh, but you get something else too. It gives you the ability to <laughs> avoid the forking. Yes, I love that forking thing. Uh, that's a great thing. Um, by the way, did you notice that Mance brought up no forking and he meant it in a different sense? He was talking about not forking the code base and the organization and legal controls. I'm talking about not forking the state and having technical controls where, yeah, you could fork, but you could never lie about it. You'd never fool anybody into believing it. So it's two different kinds of forking. In other words, what we're bringing is stability. That's what we're talking about. So we have that. And that's what the state proofs give us. But they do also give us something else. They give us the ability to do sharding in a very powerful way. Now, what is sharding? Sharding is we have a network of, say, a million computers around the world. That's what we want to grow to is millions of computers, ordinary people running ordinary machines. Anyone can do it anonymously without telling us who they are. Millions of computers around the world. And to really make it take advantage of this tremendous amount of power, you want to break them up into groups. So we don't take each file you're storing it and store it on every computer in the world. You have a group of a few hundred over here, and you store it in those. And your cryptocurrency is stored in an account, but not every computer in the world has to store it. There's a few hundred over here that store it. Each shard is doing different things. And a transaction has to be approved by the consensus of the shard. And we randomly assign people to shards. Now, if you're going to do sharding like that, there are lots of different ways of doing it. And some people are talking about ways of doing it where everyone is equal, but one shard is more equal. You could talk about we have a real chain and side chains. And this asymmetry can actually cause some problems with the flow patterns of these transactions where if I have a million shards, am I going to be a million times faster? Maybe not. It depends on the application, depends on some other issues. What you really want to do is have everybody be basically equal. That Alice has a cryptocurrency account stored in this shard, and it's only in this shard. And Bob has one in this shard, and it's only in this shard. That gives us the better ability of truly scaling up. But then the problem is, how do you make it work right? How do you ensure that the amount of cryptocurrency never changes in the total in the world. That we can send cryptocurrency from Alice to Bob, but Bob just can't create it out of thin air. How do you do that? And the answer is, well, we have the shards talk to each other. They send each other messages. This shard, when it knows that we want to transfer from Alice to Bob, decreases how much Alice has, sends a message to this shard, and this shard increases how much Bob has. But wait, how do you trust the message? If it was just some random computer over here doing it, maybe they're lying. How do we know they're not lying? We use a state proof. So any random computer in this shard makes a message that is the consensus of everyone of this shard. We, as a consensus, agree that Alice has authorized this transaction. And at the point in history where that transaction was, she did have enough cryptocurrency in her account. It should happen. We have reached consensus. This transaction should go through. So they decrease her account, create a message with a state proof that shows the message is valid. And the message now can come over to the shard where Bob is. And the shard says, this was a duly authorized message, consensus of all the hundreds of computers in that shard. We are going to increase Bob's account. And we're sure that we're keeping the rules. Like one of the rules is the total amount of cryptocurrency can't change. We're sure that although we're increasing his account, it must have gone down over there because that was the consensus. And so this is very important for sharding. This allows us then to have a sharded system where there isn't a single master with some sides. There is everybody is equal. 
you may actually have a master shard that assigns people to shards randomly, but that just happens when they join the network. It's, it's not a lot of throughput and not a lot of traffic. And so you can have efficiency. And so we end up having this kind of security. This kind of security then means that if you're using something like Hashgraph inside of each shard, which is ABFT, now the giant ledger as a whole, with all the shards as a whole, is ABFT. We can have security of the whole system because we had security of the pieces and we had the state proofs that allowed them to talk to each other security, securely. And that you could use to make things faster. Not always. You know, it's common to say, well, if I had n shards, I'd be n times faster. Yes, sometimes, sometimes not. Depends on the application, depends on the pattern of how they interact. If everybody has to talk to one shard, then we all run at the same of the speed of one shard. But if all the transactions are happening between different shards, then we run much faster. So a good ledger ought to have sharding to be fast, but it also ought to have single shards that are fast to be fast in the cases where you're limited to the speed of a single shard. We could have both. But that isn't the only kind of security we should care about. A totally different kind of security is bugs in the code, bugs in the theorems. All this stuff, all this math stuff was mathematically proven, but is it true? Math journals sometimes publish proofs that are wrong. We discover it years later. The four color theorem had uh, false proofs at one point that people believed, I think, for a decade. Amazing. So how do we prove things and trust it? There is something called formal methods where you turn this proof that humans can understand into a form that computers can understand and computers check it for you. And people have actually found bugs in widely um, deployed open source software when they got down to trying to get the computer to understand the proof, they said, oh, I see, there's bugs in the software. We have a department now, we have a group of people in our team working on formal methods, taking our ABFT proofs, formalizing them, putting them into a computer in a way that the computer can check. And they have already proved some definitions and some lemmas and some parts of it, and they're making rapid progress. And it's on, on our website. You can get it, and you can look at what they've done so far. It's fascinating. It's really actually very cool. Um, formal methods is, is the future of software, I think. And they're doing that, and that's, I said, proving that the proof is right, but you know what the next step is? The next step is showing that your software is correctly implementing the algorithm that your theorem said was ABFT. You just complete the chain. And that's the next step, and we will do that. We are going to follow this chain until we have the whole chain so the consensus software itself is known to be right. And then you expand outwards. Then we do the gossip software. Then we do some of the other software. Then eventually you go down to the operating system and the chip and all those things. And people are working on that. So formal methods are another form of security. Again, it comes down to math, but a different kind of math. COQ is the name of the system we're using to formalize it. A very cool system. Uh, yeah, talk to me sometime about it. It's really interesting. So we have security.